Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of our viewers and listeners to another Vasculitis Foundation educational webinar. I'm Kathy Alevsky, the host for the Road to Wellness webinar series provided by the Vasculitis Foundation. I'm also a patient living with vasculitis. I was diagnosed with ANCA MPA in 2008. I was in treatment for six years, and I'm extremely grateful to have been in remission off treatment for nearly eight years now. And I hope to help the Vasculitis Foundation bring awareness to our rare diseases. Today's topic is urticarial vasculitis, and we have a great guest speaker, Dr. Pavel Kohir, and a patient, Elise, and a parent of a patient, Arturo, who will all join us today. And I'd like to start by introducing our guest speaker, Dr. Pavel Kohir. Dr. Kohir is a board certified dermatologist and allergologist. He was the senior researcher and then head of the Division of Immune Mediated Skin Diseases at Sechenov University in Moscow. And in 2018, he moved to Berlin as a researcher in the Department of Dermatology, Allergy and Venerology at Charité University of Medicine. And now in 2022 at the Institute of Allergology. Dr. Cole here is a member of the steering committee for the Chronic Urticaria Registry. And now I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Cole here so that he can educate us about UV. Welcome, Dr. Cole here. So um, my name is Pavel Kohir, and I work at the Center of Reference and Excellence at the Institute of Allergology at Charité Medical University in Berlin. Um, so we are going to talk today about urticarial vasculitis, uh, which is a chronic inflammatory skin disease. Uh, urticarial vasculitis is a disregarded disease. This means that it is uh, under-recognized by academic research. Actually, there are about 300 reports, and uh, mostly case reports published in literature, uh, including about 1,000 patients with urticarial vasculitis. There are different reasons behind this, uh, and one of the reasons is the fact that um, urticaria vasculitis is a rare disease. So uh, one specialist uh, sees about five patients with urticaria uh, vasculitis per year. And who is a typical patient with this disease? So it is a female um, with a median age of onset uh, about 45 years. Urticaria vasculitis is rare in children, and the median duration is about two or three years, maximum four years. And urticaria vasculitis has a good prognosis with overall survival rates of 80% uh, at five years after diagnosis. And the worst prognosis is associated usually uh, with underlying uh, autoimmune disorder. So urticaria vasculitis uh, presents with skin and systemic symptoms, um, and uh, it, um, we can see urticaria vasculitis in up to 20, 27, 30 percent of patients initially presenting with urticaria. Uh, almost all of these patients uh, have um, wheels, so you can see them here. About 50% uh, of patients also tell about pruritus and angioedema, which is a deep swelling of mucosa. And in contrast to uh, ordinary chronic urticaria, patients with urticaria vasculitis also uh, tell about pain and burning of the skin rather than each. And there is also discoloration of the skin, uh, such as the residual hyperpigmentation or purpura in some of the patients with urticaria vasculitis. And systemic symptoms are seen in up to 50% of patients, mostly uh, joint pain, fever, uh, pulmonary symptoms, uh, abdominal stomach pain in up to 25, 30% of patients, and uh, ocular involvement such as uveitis. Urticaria vasculitis can be classified as acute, so less than uh, six weeks of duration, and chronic, uh, six or more weeks of duration. And possible triggers or causes of acute urticaria vasculitis are drugs, vaccines, and some other um, uh, products. And chronic urticaria vasculitis can be associated with underlying disorders in up to 15-20% of cases. 
uh, mostly with autoimmune diseases such as systemic lupus erythematosus, malignant tumors, and uh, infectious diseases. It was also described in the course of uh, COVID-19. So what is the mechanism uh, of uh, reticular vasculitis development? So triggers underlying diseases and also some genetic factors contribute to the activation of immune response in patients with reticular vasculitis. This leads to production of autoantibodies and, acti and activation of complement system, uh, which is a part of immune system uh, and it should defend us, it should uh, help us to fight with infection, uh, but in patients with urticaria vasculitis, um, it leads to the, it supports the inflammation and also contributes to the immune complex formation uh, and uh, production of uh, some mediators, substances, for example, such as anaphylatoxins, which also contribute to the inflammation. Then this leads to the infiltration of inflammatory cells within and around the vessels, mostly neutrophils, but also mast cells and eosinophils. They, these cells can also uh, produce uh, some mediators. And uh, in the end, this leads to the tissue damage, inflammation, and the signs and symptoms of urticaria vasculitis. So based on the complement uh, components uh, in the blood, um, urticaria vasculitis can be classified as a normal complement damage urticaria vasculitis with a normal levels, blood levels of complement components and as a hypercomplement damage urticaria vasculitis uh, when we see decrease in the blood levels of complement components. So normal complement damage urticaria vasculitis um, is seen in up to 80% of cases. Uh, it's less severe than hypercomplement damage urticaria vasculitis. Uh, symptoms are similar to chronic symptoms seen um, in chronic spontaneous urticaria. Underlying disease is rare and it's user, usually associated with good prognosis. Hypercomplement amic urticaria vasculitis is seen up to 20% of cases. It's more severe, it has longer duration. Uh, we often see systemic symptoms and underlying disease is more often detected. There is also a subform of sub, uh, hypercomplement amic urticaria vasculitis, which, which is called hypercomplement amic urticaria vasculitis syndrome. It's very rare. It shows a severe cause, multi organ involvement, and uh, it is considered a form of uh, systemic lupus erythematosus. So it's a challenge to diagnose urticaria vasculitis and several important features uh, should be taken into account. Uh, so uh, first of all, wheel duration in patients with uh, urticarial vasculitis is usually more than 24 hours. Uh, so there is a, res a resolution with residual signs, as I already said, um, skin discoloration can be seen, pain and or burning on the skin and systemic symptoms in up to 20% of patients. Urticarial vasculitis has longer duration as ordinary chronic urticaria, more severe course, especially patients with hypercomplement amic urticaria vasculitis, uh, underlying disorder, and poor response to treatment with uh, antihistamines. We can also see decreased levels of complement components in the blood and increase in uh, levels of uh, blood markers, uh, inflammatory uh, markers such as C-reactive protein and uh, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. And the gold standard for diagnosis of urticaria vasculitis is skin biopsy, and it shows signs of leukocytoclastic vasculitis, so vasculitis of small vessels. Treatment should address individual patient needs. Uh, first of all, if we know uh, triggers or underlying causes of urticaria vasculitis, we should eliminate these triggers and we should treat this underlying cause and sometimes this leads to the remission of urticaria vasculitis. Disease severity, we should also say disease severity and uh, involvement of different organs. And if we see more severe symptoms and multi-organ involvement, then it, this might require more aggressive therapy. From our recent study, we know that uh, more than half of, uh, percent of, our, of patients with urticaria vasculitis uh, uh, has a very uh, severe impairment of quality of life. And of course, in this case, we should also revise the therapy. And finally, 
patient preferences should be also taken into account. For example, concerns regarding uh, side effects of the therapy or its efficacy. So what should we do? We should raise awareness of urticaria vasculitis. Actually, uh, this talk is the first step into this uh, direction. We should develop a better diagnostic criteria of urticaria vasculitis. We should investigate possible biomarkers, which can help us to predict the disease course, its prognosis and response to treatment. And there is a lack of approved and targeted treatment uh, of urticaria vasculitis. So this is also important aim to develop uh, these treatment options. How we can do this? We need international multicenter studies and there are some studies already ongoing. Uh, there are also some uh, congresses and conferences uh, which dedicated to urticaria and urticaria vasculitis such as Global Urticaria Forum. And there is a UCARE network, which is a network of Urticaria centers, centers of Reference and Excellence. Uh, there are already more than 100 uh, centers around the world. And the aims of this network uh, are to provide excellence uh, in Urticaria and Urticaria vasculitis management to help patients with Urticaria vasculitis, to increase the knowledge of Urticaria and Urticaria vasculitis by research studies and education, and promote the awareness of urticaria and urticaria vasculitis by other activities. At our center in Berlin, uh, there are some studies uh, related to urticaria vasculitis ongoing. First study is called Uversico. Uh, this is a comparison uh, between urticaria vasculitis and chronic spontaneous urticaria in terms of natural history, disease course, and response to treatment. Next study is called Approval where we focus on patient's quality of life and factors that are associated with it. And finally, we also have task force on urticaria vasculitis, uh, which is performed by members of European Academy of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. And the main aim of these studies, um, of this task force, is to assess whether chronic spontaneous urticaria and normal complement amic urticaria vasculitis are different entities or a part of disease spectrum uh, presenting with whales. This is our team um, at Institute of Allergology at Charity. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Kalhir. That was very, um, very helpful for me and I hope it was for, for everybody else. I did wanna, um, at this point, if it's all right with you, what I'd like to do is introduce one of our patients today and let her tell us a little bit about her story and then Maybe you all can have a little bit of back and forth on that. Um, and so I'd like to introduce Elise James, and she's joining us from Sydney, Australia, Australia. And I might say it's very early in the morning. So thank you so much, Elise. Elise is 40 years old and newly diagnosed with UV in December of 2021. She lives with her 11 year old cat Willis and loves cooking, knitting, reading and hiking. So First of all, let me say welcome, Elise. I'm, I'm so happy you were able to get on here with us in the middle of the night, basically, for you. Hi, Kathy. Thanks for that. And, and if you wouldn't mind, would you tell us a little bit about um, your story, getting diagnosed, and where you stand now? Of course. Um, so I first had my symptoms of urticarial vasculitis in, I think it was July 2021, and uh, it, it appeared on my legs as just a number of wheels that would come and go. Uh, but it was pretty consistent from the first time I had it through to when I actually got diagnosed. Uh, there were, didn't seem to be a lot of a break between having these wheels. And um, they were hot, but more importantly, they were incredibly itchy all of the time. <laughs> Um, so after, I think I spoke to um, a family friend of mine, um, who is in the medical field, and they said, look, it's probably just hives, just uh, take antihistamines and just kind of monitor what they're doing. And it wasn't until I was sort of looking through uh, old messages that I realised that two months had passed and I still had them. So uh, when I was uh, going to get my COVID vaccine, I spoke to the doctor and he said, look, it is spring in Sydney. 
um, it's more than likely you're having an allergic reaction to something around here. Um, then another couple of months passed and the wheels were actually getting worse and worse and really beginning to affect my day-to-day -day existence. Um, and I had a telehealth conference with my doctor because during the time we were in lockdown for COVID-19. And so I wasn't actually able to go in and show him what was going on. And he said, again, it's probably an allergic reaction to something. Just keep taking the antihistamines. We'll talk in two weeks. Um, at that stage, the wheels had gone down slightly. So I spoke to him and said, things don't seem as bad now. I'm sure it'll be fine. What, what could be wrong? <laughs> so it wasn't until uh, December, uh, sorry, late November 2021, I was at work and I'd had a breakout and it was probably the worst one I've had. Um, I had lumps on my neck all over my body and they were red and awfully hot and swollen. And all of my workmates made a comment that there was something seriously wrong. So at that stage, I presented to the emergency department um, of my local hospital. And my, the doctor, um, in all his subtlety, said, gee, I've never seen that before. Can I take a photo? Uh, and I was <laughs> a little bit shocked and worried by that, of course. Uh, and then he um, spoke to a, a dermatology department in the hospital. And they said, because it was so unusual, they'd see me the next morning at 8 a.m. So obviously I didn't sleep a lot that night. And then when I went in, the doctor had a look and said, look, it probably is either uh, chronic urticaria or urticarial vasculitis. Um, I'll do a biopsy and you'll know within two weeks. Um, I think I was relatively lucky with the speed at which I was diagnosed. Um, from what I've heard and from people I've spoken to, this is very, very rare that it is diagnosed so quickly. Um, and I'm incredibly thankful for that. But unfortunately, finding the right treatment for me hasn't been so far successful. Um, and uh, first I was prescribed a steroid cream and a combination of that and some antihistamines at a very high dose. Um, it had only a minor effect on the wheels and I found myself so exhausted every day from the volume of drugs that I was taking that I could barely get through your average day. Um, and so at my next dermatology appointment, I spoke to the doctor and I said, look, for, for how much effect these drugs are having, which was minimal, um, I, it's, I can't get through my day without sort of wanting to sleep. And so after that, um, we discussed a number of options and Recently, um, we she came to the decision that the best option to treat was, um, I think the uh, the drug name is Planaquil. Um, it's um, hydroxychloroquine. And so I was prescribed that. Um, I am yet to begin taking it just because I tend to have a very sensitive stomach and I'm a little bit concerned about starting at that course at work because it does have a high incidence of causing nausea when you first start. But that is the next step in my journey, I guess you'd say. Um, but apart from that, the biggest struggle has just been the utter discomfort. Um, it's been a very hot summer in Sydney. Um, any clothes that rub on me, um, anytime my skin rubs against anything, um, anytime something touches me lightly, like a fly landing on my arm, it just makes me want to tear my skin off. And it's, it's been hard to come to terms with, I guess you'd say, but that's my journey so far. Well, thank, thank you so much for sharing that very personal story with us. I'll ask Dr. Colquier, is there anything that you'd like to talk to Elise about before we move on? A little? Actually, yes, I have um, two questions to Alice. Uh, thank you, Alice, for sharing your story. Um, so, um, what is actually the, the greatest challenge uh, when we talk about life uh, with surgical vasculitis? It's, uh, it's a little bit awkward, but sometimes it's just physical contact with other human beings. Um, you know, I'd had a friend put their hand on my arm and just the feeling of that contact on my skin made me want to sort of punch them in the face and run away because my skin does tend to be so sensitive. And day to day sort of if I'm out and about with um with my wheels showing obviously people are looking and thinking oh what's wrong with her what why is her skin like that and so 
while I'm not particularly vain, just having that on display is a bit much for my ego. Um, so they're probably the two biggest difficulties for me. Thank you very much. And um, I have also a second question. So how would you rate uh, the degrees in the, your quality of life if we compare it to the quality of life that you had before uh, Uchikira vasculitis? It's, it's an ever-present demon, I guess. Um, I, I think about what a good day meant to me before I was diagnosed, and it would be anything from you know, something nice happening to going to a theme park or something, I don't know. But afterwards, a good day, it, it's the vasculitis is present. Is it, was I itchy that day? Did I have a wheel in an unfortunate spot? And so your life is kind of tainted with, with the disease every time or with the disorder every time you, you think about things. And it's those moments of discomfort where the only thing you can think about is a burning itch on your ankle that literally overwhelms the ability almost to, to speak because you're just thinking about how can I stop this itch? How can I stop this discomfort? And it's overwhelming. Thank you. Elise, you've really painted um, a very descriptive picture and I appreciate it to help us all understand. Um, I think now what I'd like to do is bring in a little bit different perspective. Um, we have another guest with us, Arturo Maldonado. Hope I said that right, Arturo. Yes. And he's the father of 15-year-old Jasmine who's living with UV. Arturo and wife Melissa live with Jasmine in Oak Park, Illinois in the United States. They both attend most of Jasmine's appointments and advocate on her behalf. And Arturo is working full-time in sales for Kellogg and Melissa is a patient coordinator with uh, Athletico Physical Therapy. So um, we've just heard from Elise Arturo about her personal experiences. I, I'm very interested to hear from you about your daughter's experiences. Yes, uh, thank you, Kathy. Um, very, very similar. So Jasmine um, started uh, with a bilateral rash in December of uh, 2020. Um, she's always been an eczema kid. So we thought it was eczema. We had topical creams that we put on her body. Um, they quickly got worse. We went to our local dermatologist who said, she just has hives, uh, put her on a prednisone steroid regimen for five days. And um, it, it seemed to calm things down. Uh, but once that steroid treatment was over, uh, it came back with a vengeance. I mean, instead of her bottom half of her body, it, it was all over her body from her neck down. And the best way that I can describe it is imagine uh, having mosquito bites from your neck down with welts all over your body, burning, itching, and there's nothing that helps. That at the height of the moment is what we were dealing with uh, December, January, until we got her into Children's Hospital here in Chicago in February and the dermatologist um, uh, to at least point, um, how she said, you know, this is rare. Can I take a picture exactly for verbatim? That's what they told us. And sure, absolutely. Uh, because they've never seen anything like this. And we spent from start to finish about six hours with dermatology. Um, she couldn't diagnose it other than, uh, contact dermatitis at the time until, uh, the biopsy was done. Biopsy was done. Uh, a couple of days later, we got the diagnosis of uh, the uh, urocardiovasculitis uh, normal complements, and they referred us to allergy. Allergy, we went to allergy, kind of the same thing. We started a, a high dose prednisone regimen, um, calmed it down for a little bit. Once we started tapering off the steroids, it came back. Um, and I should back up because in between that, uh, dermatology gave us topicals and it actually, I, I feel it made it worse. Um, we had steroid cream, um, just, it, it just made it worse. So we stopped that. And, uh, in between the, the steroid dose, she would get better, um, and then get worse at the same time. 
Uh, then we started um, high doses of uh, uh, IV steroids at Children's during the summer. Um, and we, the first infusion treatment, we saw a 50% reduction in her hives, uh, which we thought, wow, this is amazing. Uh, second week, even better. Third week, even better. Um, and, but as soon as, and, and that was a thousand milligrams of, of uh, prednisone IV. So it completely shut down the immune system um, in addition to taking oral steroids. And um, we stopped the, the IV infusions and they gave us, uh, uh, as a Friday thing is a medication um, that, that they gave us in addition to the oral steroids, started taking that and uh, she had a drug reaction and the, the hives came back even, even more, worse. Um, and in between that, obviously we were locked down, online learning for her, uh, going to the doctor's appointments, getting a ton of lab work um, back and forth. And uh, then we, we went to allergy and allergy, um, you know, we were thinking, okay, is it, is it in addition to the urocardial vasculitis, you know, anything that came into contact with her skin, she had a breakout in that area. She had boots on her ankles. Um, essentially, she was in pajamas for, for the whole uh, time she was at home. She didn't want to leave the house. Uh, anything got on her skin. It, it was just, it was really, really bad. Um, and, you know, fast forward to where we're at today. Um, she's in a controlled uh, state, I would say. Um, the urocardia is under control. The hives are, are controlled. Um, we added, we added Plaquenil um, into her, her routine. Um, and um, uh, in addition to that, we also added uh, Zyrtec, which is an antihistamine as well. And she's also on a drug called mycophenolate. Um, so, uh, and in addition to that, uh, her, her allergist recommended um, Zolaire, uh, which would help with the chronic urocardia. Um, and she's currently in, on the uh, second infusion of Zolaire. So uh, her, her way of life has gotten a little bit better uh, but, you know, she's still traumatized from, you know, when she sees something on her skin, um, you know, she, she won't take a shower with the soap touching her hair. My wife washes her hair over the tub. Uh, if she does take a shower, it's, it's a, it's a very lukewarm, if not cold, three minute quick shower. Um, and, you know, she's very uh, meticulous with anything after she comes out, um, you know, touching her skin. Um, one of the things that has worked that we found out is uh, a cream that's over the counter, uh, CeraVe uh, anti-itch um, and a CeraVe sensitive skin that have helped uh, more so than, than any other topicals prescribed that we've had um, for her. Um, and, and in between that, I mean, she's, she, you know, she's not vaccinated. So um, we, you know, there's not much that we can we can do at, at, at the time with everything, the COVID restrictions going on. So her going to school and doing something normal has just really done amazing for her just confidence and, and esteem. Um, so yeah, that's, um, you know, the last uh, 14 months have, have been a, a long, long journey. Wow, it does sound like a long journey, Arturo. Thank you for sharing that. I'm gonna let Dr. Cole here, get in here and see if he has some comments for you. Thank you, Artura, for sharing your uh, the, the, the story of your daughter. Um, yes, I have a question. Um, so uh, what is the, the, the most uh, troublesome symptom uh, which you could name um, which your daughter faced um, when she, she, she had uh, urticaria vasculitis? Uh, so she still has it, um, but at the height of everything going on, um, I would say the itching, the burning, uh, uh, 
she, the only thing that helped was uh, ice packs. We were rubbing her body down with ice packs and a fan um, and keeping the house cool, having the windows open to get that cool air um, at, at the height of everything that was going on. Because as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, just imagine mosquito bites all over your body. It's, you're covered in, in just these hives, these, these wheels, these welts, and, and nothing is helping. Thank you for sharing. Okay, thank you both for sharing and Dr. Cole here for asking the follow-up questions. And now um, we are gonna get to a point in just a second where we talk to Dr. Cole here about some questions we've gotten from the general um, community of UV from some of the social media groups. But I think before we do that, I'd like to ask, starting with Elise, do you have any questions for Dr. Cole here? Um, no, not at the, at the moment. Um, I am a member of a few of these uh, support communities, and I know that a lot of people have been looking forward to asking questions, so I'll leave it for the, uh, the other experts. Okay, and how about you, Arturo? Do you have anything in particular you want to ask before we ask the other patient questions? Yeah, uh, Dr. Koval, um, in your presentation, uh, you brought up isofinophils, and um, the question that I have is, do you see isofinophil levels have anything to do with like urocardial vasculitis um, in, in some of the medication that, that my daughter has taken? Um, you know, we have a baseline of where they've been uh, as medication has been introduced. Um, they've, gone ex they've gone very high to, you know, very low and, and in between. So um, just if you can just elaborate a little bit on that. Uh, thank you, Arturo, for this question. Uh, so actually, I don't think that patients with urticaria vasculitis show uh, higher levels uh, of isinophils in the blood, high numbers, uh, high counts of isinophils in the blood. But I would say that if we see isinophilia, this means the higher counts of isinophils uh, in the blood, we should think about possible reaction to maybe to some drugs that patient takes but not um, urticaria vasculitis itself. There, is, there can be also a concomitant allergic disease in the patient with urticaria vasculitis. And this disease can also contribute to higher isonophil counts in the blood. Arturo, did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you so much for the clarification. Thank you, Dr. Cohere. And now some questions from patients in the UV community. Uh, the first one is pretty simple, but definitely needs to be asked. What is the difference between urticaria and urticarial vasculitis? Uh, this is a very, very good question. Uh, as I already said, sometimes it's a challenge to differentiate between urticaria and urticaria vasculitis. Um, so patients with urticaria um, tell um, about um, shorter duration of wheels, less than 24 hours. Uh, they usually do not have uh, systemic symptoms. They usually do not have uh, underlying uh, disorder, which can be cause of urticaria. They usually respond better to antihistamines than patients with uh, urticaria vasculitis. Uh, we usually do not see decrease in complement uh, components levels in the blood of patients with, uh, with chronic uh, urticaria. Um, and um, also we already discussed this, uh, but this is important. Patients with chronic urticaria, they have itch rather than pain or burning of the skin. Okay, thank you. Um, an another question from another patient says that I have read some research that UV, UV may be a subset or type of lupus or somehow related to lupus. And I've also read that they're completely distinct diseases. What's your opinion on that? So yes, uh, it's still a matter of debate whether um, um, urticaria vasculitis, especially hypercomplementemic urticaria vasculitis syndrome uh, can be regarded as a um, form of lupus or it's rather um, independent entity. Both diseases um, share some uh, clinical characteristics. For example, 
patients with uh, hypochondriamic urticaria vasculitis and also patients with lupus often have um, systemic symptoms. For example, um, abdominal pain, uh, stomach pain, but they also differ in uh, levels of uh, autoantibodies, which can be detected in patients with lupus, for example, antinuclear antibodies, but patients with urticaria vasculitis usually do not show increase in uh, antinuclear antibodies levels. Uh, and uh, there is also a notion that some patients with hypercomplement urticaria vasculitis syndrome can develop uh, lupus over time. I know that uh, about 50% uh, of patients which, uh, with uh, HUVS uh, meet uh, lupus criteria uh, over um, when they follow up over time. Okay, thanks. thanks for clarifying that for us. But on the subject of lupus from another patient, are there any other autoimmune diseases such as lupus that are giving any clues to potential cure or treatment for UV? Does UV have and does UV have characteristics of other immune issues? Uh, yes, there are some reports uh, where um, uh, um, patients with urticaria vasculitis also had um, some uh, autoimmune diseases. So apart from uh, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, um, patients with UV can have um, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, mixed con uh, connective tissue disease, Sjogren uh, syndrome, and some other autoimmune diseases. But it's still unknown whether the treatment of these uh, autoimmune diseases can lead to the uh, to remission of urticaria vasculitis. And this should be investigated in further studies. Well, that's why we all believe so strongly in those clinical studies and 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 the Vasculitis Foundation for helping with those. So we'll. We'll hope that's a part of it in the future. I have another um, patient that said, I have UV, but also been diagnosed with primary immune deficiency since my UV diagnosis, and was surprised to learn that people with primary immune deficiency are more common to get vasculitis. Can you comment on PI, PI and vasculitis, and are there studies into a correlation? Um, so yes, this is um, also a very interesting question. Um, I personally do not believe that uh, uh, there is uh, that this uh, association between primary immune deficiency and urticaria vasculitis um, is common. Uh, but patients with uh, primary immune deficiency um, know, are known to have higher rates of infections, and infection is known cause of urticaria vasculitis. And I also know about at least one study um, where um, out of about 5,000 patients with primary immune deficiencies, um, ha only one patient had urticaria vasculitis. So the, the rates uh, of this combination um, is quite low. Okay, thank you so much for that clarification. Um, we have a patient who says my rheumatologist and immunologist put urticarial slash urticarial vasculitis overlap syndrome as my diagnosis followed by a question mark. And then they said, I have had a positive LV biopsy 18 years ago. Have you heard of this and what exactly is it? So um, I, I already briefly mentioned this um, during my talk. Uh, so sometimes it's difficult to differentiate between um, ordinary chronic urticaria and urticaria vasculitis. They share some, uh, some clinical characteristic, uh, characteristics. Um, and it's also unknown whether uh, uh, chronic spontaneous urticaria can um, transform in urticaria vasculitis, normal complementemic urticaria vasculitis over time or vice versa. And it's also possible, and uh, I saw this in my patients, that uh, sometimes at one point of time, uh, skin biopsy from patients with uh, chronic spontane uh, with uh, urticarial rash um, shows signs of uh, ordinary chronic urticaria, and um, at another point of time we see uh, signs of urticaria vasculitis. Understood. Thank you. Uh, actually, these next three questions are from Arturo and his wife Melissa about their teenager who has 
normal complementic complementic urticarial vasculitis. Um, does this condition cause hair loss? Um, I wouldn't say so. Um, I don't think that urticaria vasculitis by itself can can lead to uh, hair loss, but um, there are other reasons which can um, uh, induce hair loss. For example, some drugs uh, can induce this, can lead to, to hair loss, and also some concomitant diseases, for example, uh, autoimmune hair disease, alopecia, can also lead to hair loss. Uh, and I wouldn't say that, that um, urticaria vasculitis in the first place is a main cause of uh, hair loss. Okay, thank you. I, I'm just gonna add a little personal thing in here. Whether it's right or not, you can tell me, but I had some hair loss during treatment for my vasculitis because of the medication that I was taking. Is that also a possibility? Yes, absolutely. So that's what I, exactly what I said. Uh, so uh, drug intake can be a possible cause of hair loss in patients with urticaria vasculitis. And um, they also want to know, does physical urticarial accompany this condition? No, um, physical care or how we also uh, also known as uh, cro uh, chronic inducible urticaria is uh, often um, concomitant disease in patients with chronic spontaneous urticaria, but not in patients with urticaria vasculitis. Okay, thank you. And his, their last question: Why does the skin become hypersensitive to everything, including nickel, during a flare-up? I'm sure this is every patient's question, so this is a good one. Yes, this is a really good question uh, because there is an inflammation. So inflamed skin, uh, it's more sensitive, it's more reactive to any other products, to any other triggers. Um, and uh, also we need to um, exclude any other um, possible causes why skin reacts to anything. Uh, for example, contact alle uh, allergy to nickel, to any other products. Understood. The, um, another common question is how common is it for a patient with UV to be diagnosed with another type of vasculitis? And are there certain types of vasculitis that tend to show up together with UV? Um, from my point of view, the combination of urticaria vasculitis with other type of vasculitis is very rare. Um, and I can tell you only about one uh, case report where a patient with urticarial vasculitis also had uh, granulomatosis with polyngitis. So um, the next question is that is very interesting. A patient with UV says, I would love to get involved with research studies for this disease. disease. I live in California, so I don't know if that would exclude me from any international research. Can you suggest ideas of how this patient can get involved? This is a really important question. Uh, so first of all, um, I would suggest, uh, this is what we are going to do. So we are going to ask um, permission from Uticare uh, Vasculitis Foundation to announce our Uticare Vasculitis related studies uh, to be announced at uh, Vasculitis Foundation website. So please keep your eyes open. Um, and second, you can also check um, UCARE network website um, because uh, all ongoing studies on HKR vasculitis are listed there. And then you can uh, find the, the um, UCARE center closest to your place of residence and ask whether you can participate in any of these studies. Okay, great. I hope that answered their question. I, I find this one very interesting. Uh, just curious, Dr. Cole here, what is the youngest patient you've ever treated for UV and the oldest? Uh, so the youngest patient uh, was um, 11 years old and the oldest one was um, about 65 years old. Okay. And um, are you as a doctor able to look at a patient's, this is kind of a two-part question, look at a patient's rash before they are officially diagnosed and be able to tell that it's UV, that UV is involved. Are there certain telltale signs of how the rash or lesions appear that tip you off to UV involvement? And actually, 
a doctor asked, are there certain manifestations or cluster of symptoms that as a general physician with the knowledge of UV to be alerted to in a patient? Yes, thank you very much. This is uh, also interesting question. We'll already briefly discuss this. Um, so yes, there are some symptoms uh, uh, when we can suspect uh, articular vasculitis. Um, for example, um, uh, wheels of long duration, uh, more than 24 hours. Uh, it's a sign of urticaria vasculitis, more than a um, sign of uh, chronic spontaneous urticaria. Also systemic symptoms. Uh, we should suspect urticaria vasculitis if patient uh, tells us of any, uh, for example, of abdominal pain, of stomach pain, of joint pain, of uh, uh, fever, of um, increased uh, lymph nodes, and so on and so forth. Um, if we, if patient uh, has no response to antihistamines, we should also suspect urticaria vasculitis. But of course, in any case, if we want to confirm the diagnosis of urticaria vasculitis, we need to perform skin biopsy because this is, for now, the most important uh, test for uh, diagnosis of uh, this disorder. That's all really great information for us as patients to know, but I think also there are plenty of physicians that watch these webinars, and I think that it was a great answer for them. Uh, I had one patient that said, will my lesions or rash from UV be permanent? Do they cause damage to the skin or usually disappear after treatment? I'm afraid my lesions will be with me forever. Um, so urticaria vasculitis usually do not uh, produce any permanent damage to the skin. And uh, as I already said, uh, the mean, uh, median duration is up to four uh, years. So it usually disappears uh, in most cases, uh, but uh, sometimes um, some underlying disorders can be present. In this case, uh, the, this disorder can um, lead to a more severe cause of urticaria vasculitis. I see. So this one is a little more um, technical for me to ask, but I'm going to, because I think everybody wants to know this, which type of UV is more prevalent or that you more commonly see, which I think you addressed a little bit in your slides, but normocomplementemic urticarial vasculitis or hypocomplementemic you carry a vasculitis, but also can normo complementomic vasculitis come become the more serious systemic form of UV? Um, so first part of the question, um, I will address. Um, so normo complementomic urticaria vasculitis is more frequent uh, than uh, hypo complementomic urticaria vasculitis. So we see an UV in uh, up to 80% of cases and uh, HUV in up to 20% of cases. Um, and uh, yes, of course, um, uh, normal complementary urticaria vasculitis can develop into hypercomplementary urticaria vasculitis. So sometimes when you check for uh, complement components in blood, they are normal um, within reference range. And then uh, you can check them one year after uh, disease onset, and then you see that uh, uh, they went down and uh, some systemic symptoms can appear. Of course it can happen, but I would say that it's unusual. It's not frequent. Okay, thank you. Um, so I also see that uh, I'm a, somebody that says, I'm a patient living with hypocomplementemic urticarial vasculitis diagnosed in 2020. And they want to know, am I especially vulnerable to COVID because of this disease? They're not currently taking any immunosuppressant, but they are still taking recommended masking and vax precautions. Yes, this is a very relevant question. And um, so we all know that uh, COVID-19 um, affects um, lungs. So it can um, lead to uh, pneumonia. And we also know that, uh, and as I, as I already told, um, that uh, HUV, hypercomplementemic urticaria vasculitis, uh, also shows uh, very often um, lung involvement. So these patients can, uh, can have uh, pulmonary symptoms. And in these patients, 
with HUV, with uh, lung involvement, COVID-19 can lead to more severe cause. Mm. This should be taken into account. And um, second, there are some reports where um, urticaria vasculitis developed after COVID-19 or after vaccination against COVID-19. Right. But uh, I'm not aware of any reports. Maybe they exist, but uh, I don't know about them. Dr. Cole here, we had a question also um, about hot and cold. Can you tell us what impact heat or cold has on the urticarial rash? Yes, so it's also in line what Alice asked. Uh, yes, um, so in some patients, heat and cold can, uh, ex uh, can lead to exacerbation of urticaria vasculitis. And on the other hand, I would say that in some patients, they also ease the symptoms, they, they can decrease the, the symptoms. So it's, um, it depends on the patient. Okay, it depends on the patient. Okay. Thanks. Okay, and another question for you, Dr. Kohir. Um, is there any evidence that a patient that presents with shingles will later get a diagnosis of urticarial vasculitis? Um, can you please explain what, what shingles is? Shingles, um, herpes. Uh, I see. I see. The, the uh, usually on the shoulder and the trunk. I got it. Um, yes. So um, there might be some reports, uh, as I already said, that infection is a possible cause of urticaria vasculitis. So and herpes virus is also infection, viral infection. So, uh, of course, this can lead to um, urticaria vasculitis and also to ordinary chronic urticaria. It can be a possible cause. But usually, I would say that um, after herpes virus is gone, uh, at least suppressed by immune system of patient, uh, symptoms of urticaria vasculitis or ordinary chronic urticaria should also go. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Cole here, can you tell us how important it is to have a dermatologist as part of the patient's care team? Um, I would say that it's, it's important if it's possible um, because um, it's a specialist, specialist uh, who knows a lot about um, skin diseases and um, uh, urticaria vasculitis and urticaria in particular. And uh, it has expertise uh, to help a patient uh, in management uh, of urticaria vasculitis or ordinary chronic urticaria. So um, yes, I would say um, it's, it's important to, to have a specialist in, in this team. Okay. Thanks, thank Kathy. You. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Cole here. And I and this will be our last patient question, but then we're gonna um, talk to Arturo and Elise and see if they have anything else they wanna ask or and we'll come right back to them. But this last patient question is, my UV is in remission, but I'm afraid that either COVID or the vaccine could trigger a flare, which you just addressed a little bit. Is there a reason for concern? Is there anything special I should be doing to protect myself from COVID? So in case you wanna add on to what you just said. Yes. Yeah, so as I said, I, I would recommend uh, to, to, to be vaccinated. Uh, it's the most important thing that, that should be mentioned here, that all patients with uh, urticaria vas vasculitis should be vaccinated against COVID. Okay, thank you. Um, and now I just want to ask, I'm going to start with you, Arturo, um, if you can unmute yourself. I just want to ask you, is, do you feel like you learned something that you didn't know from this webinar today, first of all? Yeah, absolutely. I, I love Dr. Uh, Pavel's presentation of just uh, a high level of, of UV and, and I jotted down that, that UCARE network um, information to go and, and look at it myself. So yes, thank you for this forum. Any questions that didn't get answered that you want to ask now? Um, so I do have a question and, and he did address it re and that, that's in regards to the COVID vaccination. So we, we are uh, in the process of, of working with uh, my daughter's rheumatology uh, to get her vaccinated, but at the, at the height of everything, um, rheumatology had recommended to, to just kind of wait. Um, Dr. Pavel, have you have any 
of your uh, UV patients? Have you seen any adverse effects from, you know, the, the two dose vaccination and the booster um, or the single, you know, the first, uh, you know, J and J vaccine? Have you, have you seen anything, any outbreaks or um, have most of your patients, have they been, have, have, have they developed antibodies to the vaccine? Thank you, Arturo. This is an interesting question. Um, so uh, from my personal experience, um, uh, so I did not see any severe reactions after vaccination uh, against um, COVID-19, uh, also in patients with urticaria vasculitis, also in patients with urticaria. Uh, and most reactions uh, which I saw, they were mild reactions. Um, so I also uh, remember about uh, people who had um, fever after vaccination. Um, but other than that, I, I would say that there were no severe reactions. I know that these reactions were described in the literature, not in relation to educated vascular, just in general. They were described in people who, get, uh, who got vaccinated. But... Um, I didn't, I didn't um, see these patients. I didn't see this in, in my patients. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And now I'm gonna, Arturo, anything else? No, that's all, thank you. Okay, great. And now I'm gonna go to Elise. First question, Elise, did you learn something today from the presentation and the webinar? Yeah, look, I'd agree with Arturo as well. Just uh, when I was diagnosed, I wasn't given a lot of information about the disease or um, or who to speak to about it. Um, so it's good to know there is a kind of network of people out there that I can kind of reach out to, I guess. Um, but just in terms of just the disease in general and how it's, how it's sort of managed and how it's discovered, I guess, it's been really interesting to find that out. So thank you. Sure, and, and do you have any last questions you want to ask today? Actually, actually one did pop up um, that um, it just kind of came to me um, from, um, from Dr. Pavel's discussion was that um, obviously stress and drugs um, were listed as two of the, the things that might cause a, um, an outbreak of, um, of urticaria vasculitis. Um, are there any other lifestyle triggers um, beyond that and beyond any kind of pre-existing diseases that might cause an outbreak? Thank you, Liz. Um, so I'm trying to, to figure out whether there are any other factors which can worsen um, the course of urticaria vasculitis. And I can't think about anything else. Maybe some food, um, some food can, can um, lead to exacerbation of urticaria vasculitis in a few patients. Uh, I read about this, but I personally did not see this in my patients. Um, it's more, um, why I'm telling about this, because food is more relevant trigger in patients with ordinary chronic spontaneous care than in urticaria vasculitis. Um, so some vaccines, um, maybe in, in a few cases, and um, maybe physical exercise, but again, these are just very, very triggers. So I wouldn't say that. So in most, in most uh, cases, I didn't see this. I did want to say at this point, thank you to our three guests, Dr. Cole here. It was amazing to see your presentation clear up a lot of the things that we didn't know about UV. And Arturo, um, to you and your family, we appreciate you telling that story of how your daughter has dealt with this. Elise, it's been um, not so long of a journey for you, but I hope today's information has helped you know what's in your future and how to work with this. And I wish you, I wish you all well. And um, I did want to say thank you so much to the Vasculitis Foundation for hosting this important uh, one of the webinars, part of their educational series. And also this year, maybe watch for more disease specific videos as well. Very Thank good. you very much.